Uh, thank you, Hill, for your kind words. Uh, I have very much appreciated the friendship. We meet once a month for two hours up in uh, Northern Virginia for lunch. And, uh, it's been a real delight and joy for me. But he, he kept a secret from me. I didn't know you were a 12-string rock and roller there. <laughs> Oh, I need to talk to the uh, I need to talk to the young guitarist. I want to know if you uh, break out jamming at practice or anything. You know, <laughs> have to hear about this. Well, uh, we read this. Let's go to verse twenty-one if we can. We saw here in the passage we read that Jesus uh, prayed not only for the twelve, but he said he prayed for us, those who would believe through them. This prayer was offered the night before he died. Probably, he very well may well have prayed this while he and the disciples were walking from the Last Supper to the Garden of Gethsemane. He may have prayed this while he was actually walking along with them. And what does he pray for us? That they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they may be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are. So he's praying that we would be one. And the reason, in part, is so that the world would believe that God sent Jesus. Our unity, our oneness, is essential for the world to understand that God indeed sent Jesus. All right? I in them, you in me, that they may be what? Perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you love me. Again, perfected in unity are we because of the work that Christ has done and the prayer that he prayed for us. Again, why? So that the world may know that God sent Jesus and that God loves them. Thanks. What does he pray for us here? Again, that they might see, that we might see, the glory of Jesus that was given to him by the Father in the Trinity in the Godhead, and that God actually loved Jesus before the foundation of the world. And essentially, God and Jesus and the Spirit have this harmonic, loving relationship with each other, and they have brought us, invited us, and placed us into that relationship with them, and there we are, connected to them and connected to one another through this prayer. <clears throat> o oh, righteous Father, the world has not known you, yet I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. Mm -hmm. And I have made your name known to them, and will make it known. Why? So that the love with which you love me may be in them, and I in them. What a prayer that we're one that we're with him, that we can behold his glory, that we're actually with him where he is. Again, this reality of our unity with him and with each other is essential, God says, so that the world might know that God loves them and sent Jesus to them. This, folks, is our reality. This is as true as you and I are sitting here today. We are one. We have actually been perfected in unity. Nothing else is needed. We are perfect in our unity with one another. That's our reality. That's our place. <coughs> and we need to learn how to embrace and to understand and to live in that reality. Just like if one of us was here today and your neighbor here whispered over to you and says, I'm not here. <laughs> you would understand that life's probably not work, going to work very well for that person because their reality is they're in this room, right? But if they think they're not in this room, in other words, they deny their reality, <coughs> life doesn't work too good when we don't do that. And likewise, if we as the church of Jesus don't embrace and acknowledge our reality that we are one with Christ and we're one with one another, then church won't work too good either way. Today, we begin a nine-week uh, church-wide series 
here at FICC on peacemaking, of being peacemakers. Now, if any of you are baseball fans, <clears throat> you know that the first batter is called the leadoff batter. And the objective of the first batter, most essential, is to do what? Get on base. The manager of the team doesn't care if you walk. You can bunt. You can even do something to try to cause an error. Or you can get a single. Just get on base and leave what? Leave it to the power hitters to drive in the runs. Well, today, I'm the leadoff batter. And our, my objective is to help us get to first base this morning. And then we're going to leave the power hitters, Raul and Hill and Fidel, to drive in the runs over the next eight weeks. Okay? Is he with me? Y'all going to help me get to first base? And let's all get to first base together today. That's our objective. So let me pray for us, and uh, we'll see if we can't get down to those 90 feet together. Father, thank you for this prayer that you've retained for us in Scripture, that we can see your very heart for us, that you loved us, and you invited us into the love relationship that you have among yourselves. Thank you that you're here with us today. If you're with us, we know that you're not passively with us. You're here actively with us. You are with us in all of the intensity of your divine being. You're with us in your love. You're with us in your holiness. You're with us in your righteousness. You're with us in your goodness and your loving kindness. You're with us in your anger. You're with us in your jealousy. You're with us in your grace. You're with us in your patience. You're with us in your knowledge, in your power. You're with us in all the intensity of your divine nature. Every attribute of yours, you're all of your holy attributes are here with us today and you are loving us with all of the intensity of your person. That is sufficient. We rest in your presence. We rest in your reality and ask that you would help us to know your heart and what's on your mind today. In your son's name, amen. Peacemaking. Why this series? Why have your leaders here decided to spend nine weeks as a church focused on peacemaking? We know why, don't we? There are problems in the body of Christ, perhaps here at FICC. We feel it. We experience it. We hurt others. Others have hurt us. We don't live into this reality of our unity as Jesus prayed for us. We don't preserve the oneness that we have. We settle for a counterfeit of just keeping the peace. And think, well, that's just the way it is. That's the best it can be. We we'll just try to keep the peace and not rock the boat. After all, we're only human. We know we ought to be at peace with one another because that really is what our reality is. And we need to learn how to live into our reality, not to try to achieve the reality of unity. We have it. But how do we learn how to believe it and to receive it? and to live into that reality which is ours. The teaching of Scripture in Romans 6 is what? We have died with Christ. We have been buried with Christ. We have risen with Christ. Colossians 3 tells us we are raised with Christ and seated with Him in the heavens. What did Jesus pray for us? I pray that they might be with me where I am. And behold my glory. And we're there. Ephesians 4 says there's one body, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Walk in a manner worthy of your calling. Be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit. Don't try to make it. We have it. But preserve it. Don't break it. Don't break the reality that is yours. So in John 17, <clears throat> I remember when I was in college at Virginia Tech, I probably thought this way about the prayer, but I've come to realize by thinking about it was Eric. Jesus was not some 
you know, American hippie in the 1960s praying, oh God, wouldn't it be wonderful if my followers would be one? And God says, yes, wouldn't it be nice? But no, Christ is praying according to the will of the Father. And that prayer has been answered. We are one. We are united. We are one body. We are perfected in unity. Okay? Is that our reality? You can say yes. Alright, we're halfway to first base. How's that? 45 feet to go. <clears throat> Why is it hard? Why is it hard? For me? Why is it hard for you to believe? Why is it hard to receive? Why is it hard to live into this reality of our unity, of our oneness with each other and with the Godhead? Because there's a second reality that is ours as well. And we find that in the first book of Genesis. So I want to go through a few things that happened at creation and then in, in that horrific fall afterwards that I hope will give us some insight, has given me insight into why I do the things I do and my many frequent uh, actions and thoughts and words that don't preserve the unity I have with you and with others and hope you can uh, gain some insight that will uh, encourage you as you go through this nine-week series. All right, if, if you do have a Bible, <clears throat> uh, park it open to Genesis 2 and 3, and we'll, I'll reference a few things here. Actually, the first thing I'm going to reference is over in Genesis 5, 2. It's kind of a summary of the creation account. Genesis 5, 2 says... <clears throat> And well, actually, 5.1, it says, This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day when God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female, and he blessed them and named them man in the day when they were created. He created man. He made them male and female and named them man. Interesting. When we think of God created man in his image. The scripture teaches that the full expression of God in humanity requires maleness and femaleness. It's male and female together that makes man. We call it mankind. But to see that it's not though so much that I male am in the image of God or you female is in the image of God that we are. But more so, the best picture of God is seen in maleness and femaleness together. Not just in marriage, but in community, in harmony, in the body of Christ, in, in families. It takes maleness and femaleness together to best express the likeness and the image of God. Then God, after creating uh, the man and woman, gives them their human job description. And we see that in 1 and 2. And God basically in here tells them that you are to reign. You're, I've made you in my image. You're to reign in this earth. You're to rule. You're to have dominion. You're to subdue and you are to cultivate this earth. That's the human job description. And male and female, you're to partner together. You're co-regents. You're co-rulers in this enterprise of reigning and ruling and subduing and having dominion and cultivating this earth that I've given you. I've made you in my image. Now, go be me. Be God in this place. And furthermore, he designed the family. So the first job is work, reigning, ruling, all that, all that encompasses the issue of work in, the, in our life. The second is family. God says, furthermore, I want more of you. I want you to be fruitful and multiply. Remember what God said all, every day, at the end of every day when he came home from work, what did he say? It's good. Did a good job today. On the sixth day, after he made male and female, what did he say? Very good. That God looked and said, that's very good. Good day at the office. 
And so he says, I want more of you. Be fruitful and multiply. You know that God only created two people in his image, Adam and Eve. God has not created anyone in his image since then. If you are in the image of God, who made you in God's image? And it wasn't God. Who made you in God's image? It's not a trick question. Who made you in God's image? Who made you in God's image? Who do you call mom and dad? Your mother and father made you in God's image. That blows my mind. God said, Adam, I'm creating you in my image. I want more. Be fruitful and multiply. Isn't it amazing that God put within Adam and Eve the capacity as image bearers of God to do what? To create more image bearers. We used to call it procreation, creating for. Adam and Eve couldn't create out of nothing. God created out of nothing. But once God created, he said, I'm putting within you the capacity to create more like me. My kids say, Dad, it doesn't take much to entertain you. But that entertains me. <laughs> That that uh, blows some circuits in my feeble brain. The job description. Family. Work. Family. And then God spoke among themselves and said, let us make man. God is in community with himself. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit speaking to each other. And said, let us make man in our image. God is a God of community. He is in community with himself. And this wonderful, harmonic relationship and because they are love they want to invite others they want to enlarge the circle of love and they created man and woman and invites us into that relationship with each other and so we bear the same need the same mark to live in community with each other because we're in the image of God now upon the end of creation God then defines reality for Adam and Eve work family, community. These are the sacred essences of your life. In Genesis 2.8, the scripture says that God planted <clears throat> and the Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden. And there he placed the man whom he had formed. And he said to them, in this garden are all trees for food. And interestingly enough, God created those trees and what does those trees, what does every plant have the possibility to do? Bear fruit, fruit bearing seed. Every plant is designed to be able to reproduce itself in some way because God is a reproductive God who wants more. <coughs> then there's the tree of life. And he says, there's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This is reality. God didn't put a tree there and said, all right, now this is going to be the test. We're going to put one out of bounds thing here. Everything else is fine, but don't break the test. That was not what God did. It wasn't some arbitrary thing. He was defining reality for them. Satan, if you recall, had rebelled against God in the heavenlies and had been cast to earth. So evil is present on the earth. And God is telling Adam and Eve, evil is present. I've given you all of this. Eat it, enjoy it, eat of the tree of life, live forever. But don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the day you eat of it, you will die. You are not wired. You are not made to handle the knowledge of good and evil. It will kill you. You cannot handle it. Those of you who work in the government would understand that God said to them, this is beyond your pay grade. <laughs> and it's been killing us ever since. It's been killing us ever since. Satan comes to the woman and says, has God said you can eat of these trees. And the woman said, we can eat of every tree of the garden except one. And, but if we eat of it, and she actually threw in and touch it, we will die. And Satan says, God's holding out on you. You will die. He knows that the day you eat of it, you'll be like him. You will know good and evil. He's holding out on you. He's not a good God. Don't let him keep you from what you should have. What did she do? She ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Adam, being a wimpy male, <laughs> ate with her. And now a new reality sets in. 
They didn't embrace the reality that God had given them. They didn't believe God. And now they've wreaked havoc. In Genesis 3, 14 and 15, God said to the woman, what have you done? She says, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So God says to the serpent, you are cursed all of your days. And furthermore, war will rage between you and the seed of the woman. And that's been going on ever since. The evil one is at war with the sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. And God even gives a prophecy here. One day there will be one seed that will take you down. Yeah, you're going to bruise his heel. And he's going to crush your head. By the way, say, evil. We saw it in our community yesterday, the shooting at the Columbia Mall. A young, one of the young men killed was from our town. Evil, raging, heartache, mental illness, on and on. Then next, God says to the woman, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you shall bring forth children. But your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Well, the first part is very understandable for any woman here. And any man here who says he thinks he understands it better keep his mouth shut. Because we don't. <laughs> My wife reminds me, you have no idea <laughs> what that's like. But there's a, the second part of this is very interesting. He says to Eve, your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. And we go, what in the world does that mean? Well, if we go over to Genesis 4 and the account of Cain and Abel, we read this, and I think it gives us insight. You know, Cain has offered an unacceptable sacrifice to God. God says this is not right, this is not pleasing. <coughs> Cain probably knew it, but he chose to think he could do it anyway. And God comes to anger to Cain. To Cain. Cain, why are you so angry? Why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not well, sin is crouching out the door, and its desire is for you. But you must master it. Cain, sin's desire is for you. You must master it. What do you say to Eve? Eve, instead of this co-regency with Adam, your desire is going to be for him. Sin's desire is for you. Sin's desire is to what? To control. To dominate. Eve, instead of a co-regency and a harmonic working relationship with Adam, you're going to want to control him. Your desire will be for him. But he's going to rule you. Now the woman will seek to control in her female way. To seduce, to manipulate, to deceive, to be coy, to people please. What does the male do? He seeks to rule in all the wrong ways too. He's going to use his maleness to abuse, to strut power, to threaten, and yes, to pout. Instead of this harmonic working relationship as co-regents, now we have war between male and female. Tragic. It kills us. It kills us in our family. It kills us in the workplace. It kills us in the church. On and on. Then he turns to the man. Adam, because you've done this, here's the deal. All of creation is cursed because of you. The ground is cursed. There's going to be thorns and thistles. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. Instead of this wonderful ability to work and to co-create with me. Unending. Unending. Things to do and to learn and to explore. Now it's going to be sweat. It's going to be toil. The second law of thermodynamics, those of you who are engineers, Isaac Newton's second law is what? The law of entropy. Everything tends toward what? Disorder and decay. That's why you have to paint your house. That's why, ladies, you have to get up and put mascara on in the morning. Men, that's why we go from, you know, six-pack to two-liter. <laughs> because of the second law of thermodynamics, everything tends toward disorder and decay. And Romans 8 speaks of this. What we face on this earth is a result of eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
I'm in a small group of some men, and we studied Romans a couple years ago. Romans 8, I felt, was life-changing for me. And Paul says, I consider, in 8.18, I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to fertility, not of its own will, but because of God who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption. That's the second law of thermodynamics. Slavery to corruption. Into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. And we know that the whole creation, what? Groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. You remember what happened in your beloved homeland? The typhoon. I think typhoons and earthquakes and tornadoes and hurricanes and all of this uh, polar vortex from uh, uh, droughts are all the earth is heaving, is crying out, set us free, set us free from this law of entropy, this disorder, this decay, and set it right again, O oh God. The earth is in upheaval, and in that reality we live. And then what happens? Not only is the earth groaning, we ourselves having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. We groan. We are in the process of dying. An hour ago, an hour now, we've died together. We're all an hour closer to the grave than we walked in this room. Cheer up. So we groan. Aches, the pains, everything. Disorder, decay. We long to be set free. And of course we have hope that one day God will set the world to rights. He will redeem this body. And the amazing God that he is, not only is creation groaning and we're groaning, the Spirit himself. We have a God who groans with us. He comes and he groans with us because God's heart is aching that this world, that his image bearers are not what it ought to be. So how does this reality impact us in the downy dirty of life here in Spotsylvania, Stafford counties, and the rare area? How does this impact our relationship as brothers and sisters here at FICC? Because you and I have eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We have a tendency, a strong tendency, to do three things that kill us. We mix up evil and good. We call evil good and good evil. God says this is evil. Mankind says, ah, that's not so bad. God says, this is good. And we say, nah, it's not really that good. This is probably better. <coughs> Isaiah says, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. My tendency, having eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, is I think that I know what's good and what's evil. Then what do we do? We judge God. In our county yesterday, people cry out, God, why why did you let? I'm sure you, I, I, probably a day doesn't go by that something thought like this doesn't cross my mind. God, where were you when? My God would never. God, if you are, then you will. How could you not? And we are capable of judging God as to what he ought to be doing at any given point in time. And the most insidious thing as a result of us eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is that we judge each other. See, having eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, I'm qualified to observe a point of time in you, to hear you say something, to see you do something, and having seen that, I am qualified to judge you. I know why you did it, I know your motives, I know what's going on with you, when you said that to me, I am now justified to be indignant towards you because I have the knowledge of good and evil. As God says, in the day you eat of this tree, you will die. Calling good evil and evil good, judging God and judging each other, kills us. So why this series on peacemaking? We know why, don't we? 
There are problems and we know it. We hurt others and others hurt us. We settle for just keeping the peace. When God, God calls us to be a peacemaker who seeks to restore broken peace, who seeks to reconcile, who seeks to call us back to the reality of our unity in Christ. Why this series on peacemaking? Because our base reality as the sons and daughters of the first Adam is that we call evil good and good evil. We judge God and we judge each other. Why this series on peacemaking? Because our greater reality as sons and daughters of the second Adam, the Lord Jesus, is that we are united. We are one. That is our reality. All right, gang? <clears throat> We're on first base. So now we can start leading off. Just don't, get, don't let Gail take you off. Okay? <laughs> For the next eight weeks in sermon, in your life groups, in your life to lifetime, some of you are knowing one on one discipling relationships, you'll be fleshing out a fuller understanding of this. How many of you are in life groups right now? Raise your hand if you're in a life group. Okay? If you're in a life group, I encourage you to invite someone who's not in a group with you for this nine-week series especially. If you're not in a group, get in a life group. Bang on the door. Break the combination. Get in. Ask someone, can I come to your group? Just try it for nine weeks. If it's, it don't work, quit after this. But this is a, a key, key time for the life of FICC. Peacemaking. And here you'll get to flesh out and gain a fuller understanding and to grip the reality of this baseness for us that is breaking us, that is hurting us. And come to grips and learn how to live in the full liberation that is ours as we live into our greater reality. I wish you bon voyage and Godspeed in that journey. Can we, would it be appropriate if we stood and held hands while I pray? Is that okay?